Welcome back, everyone, to this edition of Security Weekly, episode 400. This is our very special panel. One vulnerability to rule them all until the next one. This panel is sponsored by Pony Express. Check out the community edition and turn your Nexus 7 into a lean, mean pen testing machine. For all those hard to reach places, there's Pony Express. Visit them on the web at ponyexpress.com. I am in here in studio with everyone but Jeff that I introduced earlier and on the lines via Skype. We have, <laughs> I was going to start from the left, I think I still will, Mr. Dave Kennedy it's is here It's great to be us. here, everybody. Great to be here. Welcome, Happy Dave. Thanks for having me. Very nice. Uh, HD Moore joins us today as well. Welcome, HD. Hey, guys. Good to have you back on the show. Um, <clears throat> Rob Fuller, a.k.a. Mubix, is here with us. Welcome, Rob. How's it going? Uh, on the lines via Skype, I also have John Strand, who's joined us for this segment as well. Hi. <laughs> so I'm going to jump right into it and ask, why is it that 2014 seemed to have so many big vulnerabilities? Does it make it special? Was it just it got more press? What's the deal? It's the names, man. It's the names. It got, the the names. got the heart bleeds. We got no names, man. No names. The Je Jennifer Lawrence's. It's been a good year. Oh, yeah. I like oh, that one. No. Can we Chris the new NTV bug? Uh, NTV diddle. <laughs> <laughs> yes we've got a name oh, no I, honestly i think i think the reason why you're seeing a lot of it uh, right now is a combination of um, bugs that have massive impact on large portions of externally facing uh, systems which is causing a freak out on top of it i think um the whole cyber 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 thing is getting a lot more play um in the media and, and I, so it's a matter I, of getting accustomed i don't to have, it have enough booze to drink that i think I that was four four cybers four cybers there was four four <laughs> cybers yes does that require and, us to and, drink double and i fists? think I start, I start off with cybers and i move to apt's so just a heads up god damn it Son of a, dave, 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 dave stop dave. it some of us have I, to drive home I, today I, I won't even go to big day that's that's just jacked up okay i won't do that to you guys but cyber and apt is totally free game but have, have these big vulnerabilities been around before and just no one's been reporting them? I, so, wait. I, I, so, uh, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, guys, just to put it, is this year bigger and badder from a technical perspective than 2008 was? I mean, w w just, just in your thoughts. Like I miss. 08067. We had um, 08067. We had Dan Kaminsky uh, presented on the DNS thing. Right. Um, so I think that that was a pretty big year. Uh, this year actually seems bigger to me, not just because it shaved so it looks bigger. <laughs> well, we don't have also, this. by the way, I'm just thinking if you lose 100 pounds like I did, it gets bigger too. But anyways. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't lose it. It just rearranged. Oh, my chair just it's deflated. It's all about <laughs> perspective. I think it's what Dave's trying to say. See, and oh, throughout but, this whole thing, well, H.D. Moore is being quiet. That's because he's the kung fu master waiting for the right point to kick all our asses for on perspective, <laughs> how many of this year's big vulnerabilities were vulnerabilities in 2008 that we hadn't discovered yet? Yeah. <laughs> True. I mean, absolutely. Well, I mean, but look at it. I mean, you have the media, which is now taking a big interest in it uh, because there's a lot of hype in it. There's a lot of... Um, publicity and it's getting a lot of uh, reactions so I mean it's going to be continued to be in the media stream especially you know you're seeing what's happening now I mean it, I also feel like it's like it always happens like a, a cataclysmic effect always happens in Christmas as well so like last year we had Target this year Sony um, but I think this year was probably the largest one we've seen at least that I can uh, remember most notably I mean obviously we had the Kaminsky bug uh, but you didn't really see mass exploitation of that occur you saw mass exploitation occur of Heartbleed so you know um, to me, I think it's been a much bigger year than, than any other year we've seen. So, and so HD, I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot. Being the <laughs> developer and curator of Metasploit for so long, have you seen vulnerabilities in the past that you're like, wow, when that becomes public, that's going to be a really big deal? So like this year, are you like, kind of like, yeah, whatever? No, actually, this year's been a little bit weird because we've seen a lot of large-scale vulnerabilities that don't result in public exploits any time yes. right after ex exploitation. I mean, uh, Rob will tell you as much around the Kerberos bug. It drove us crazy that no one was working on it besides a small group. Um, and so we're seeing a lot of really large-scale vulnerabilities, but not a whole lot of public information about them. We see a lot more uh, companies hedging their bets by doing very limited, detailed uh, marketing releases, uh, adding stupid names to vulnerabilities, things like that. And 
it's basically putting us back to where we were in 2001, 2002, when security became such a hot uh, commodity um, in terms of marketing, press, and sales that people stopped sharing information about it. So I feel like, yeah, we've seen a lot of big vulnerabilities this year, but that's because these companies are now putting the marketing departments behind getting the attention, getting the press, and getting mainstream media, not just the tech media, to cover it. So uh, kind of on that note, though, uh, do you th- I, I heard this at a conference I was at a couple of weeks ago, and I, I don't I don't completely agree with it. But one of the things the guy that was presenting said was, we're seeing security researchers that used to be all about buffer overflow, buffer overflow, heap overflow, buffer overflow, heap overflow. Uh, a lot of those vulnerabilities are getting scoured very, very hard. We're now seeing security researchers move into things and starting to look at SSL, moving into things to looking at command injection like heart, uh, like uh, shell shock. Like they're basically branching out and looking into other different types of protocols and looking at the way things are working rather than just trying to do the standard buffer overflow and fuzzing. And that's seeing another huge uptick because that's really fertile green pastures. Pastures. Do you think that that's part of it or do you think it's the same as it's always been? It's just, like you said, better marketing, better names and cooler vulnerabilities this year. I think the, Ker- the Kerberos bug is a really good example of that. The Kerberos issue, um, the fact that uh, you can do CRC collisions with devs, that, that's awesome. Like That's amazing. That's great. That probably affects more than Microsoft and most people aren't aware of that. Um, and so I think I feel like uh, we've already knocked all the low-hanging fruit off the other exploitable, like things like the open SL to open master key vulnerability, things like that, all the low, uh, you know, easy to find uh, remote exploitable bugs have mostly been found, fixed, and and you know, killed off at this point through exploit mitigations or some other mechanism, even when they are found. So folks are now focusing on logic vulnerabilities, data disclosure vulnerabilities, things like that, because that's where you get the most bang for your buck, and that's going to continue evolving as we go forward. If Five years from now, most logic bugs are fixed. We'll start targeting humans again, or we're still targeting the next iteration of uh, automation scripting or gullibility. Now, do you think that they're going to slowly recharge over time? Like, you know, it's not like we scoured them and they're gone. It seems like they, they start percolating up over a period of time. We focus someplace else and then focus back again. Um, I don't want to speak for the whole panel, but I, I think we've seen newer software releases introduce some of the older style vulnerabilities again and again. However, they're not quite as significant as they used to be due to the fact that most OSs have enough exploit hardening at the compilers and at the kernel and library level that exploiting them has not become much more difficult than it was in the past. So I do feel like we're repeating history a bit with new features and new releases of software, but the ability to exploit those vulnerabilities is becoming much harder. Yeah, I mean, for the panel, is have, have we truly reached a point where you are more impressed with the protections in modern operating systems against those more traditional buffer overflow style attacks? Certainly. Yeah, so go hack your router instead. Yeah, exactly. Well, but you know. honestly, I don't think that I don't think that this year is any bigger than any other year. Um, like 2013 was the year of Java. There was 4 billion Java exploits. There were even websites, you know, put up saying how long has it been since Java has been exploitable. I, you know, in 2014 there hasn't been a single Java exploit. Uh, publicly, at least available, um, that I know of. Uh, and I just think it's, you know, just like normal IT and every other field in, on the planet focuses on different things as, you know, what trends, just like big data and stuff like that. I think Exploit Dev does the exact same thing. This year it trended on like SSL and, and Kerberos and, and other things. I think it'll just trend something next year. Next year. Well, there's there's definitely a big gap appearing between um, the the low end of the scale and the high end of the scale. So, for example, you know, folks are now focusing on logic bugs with um, you know the Kerberos bug, with uh, the OpenCell Heartbleed bug, things like that. Uh, but on the other side of the scale, you've got you know a couple hundred thousand ICS devices with VNC open or port of sale terminals <laughs> that are just wide open with no password. So you're seeing a pretty wide split now. On one hand, we're seeing improved security of modern OSs and modern applications. On the other hand, we see still zero security on the other half of the world. But you can't you can't expect them to do it. There's, the asset management is, is incredibly hard when you have 500,000 you know, engineers putting things on the network every five seconds. So, well, the, And the vendors who are building those systems don't care. They have right. no reason to deliver secure products. First to um, market. Yeah, and to some extent, we're seeing the same thing happen with NoSQL, with a lot of the the new Web 3.0, if you want to call it technology bullshit. Um, we're seeing a lot of things where a lot of these new applications don't even bother having authentication. I mean, Elasticsearch didn't even bother doing authentication until recently, um, and it's being massively exploited across the internet right now. So that's a good example of how new technologies are being built, and even though there's not a remote stack overflow, it's still remote code execution. 
And just because you know certain things like uh, Java haven't had exploits doesn't mean they're going to be not there in the future. I mean, Java had just released a patch like uh, like uh, was it in uh, October, the last patch of the year, which had 154 vulnerabilities addressed on it. So I mean, you know, we're going to continue to see a lot of the different uh, you know attack vectors that are going to continue to, to move into 2015. Nothing's going to change, um, and I think we're still going to be busy for the next you know number of years. I think. The amount of press that we've gotten this year was unprecedented, and I think the amount of visibility that we had in, in board uh, meetings and to executives is completely different than we've ever had before in the industry. I mean, I was just at a board meeting for a manufacturing company two days ago, and uh, they were, you know, scared shitless of what was going to actually happen to their organization, which isn't the right approach. But at the same time, they're getting visibility where they can get funding for security, where you know you have a demographics of 700 IT folks to two security folks not possible to get a very good security program built with those type of, of statistics. So, I mean, I think there's some positives uh, with these. I mean, a lot of people rip on the names and everything else, uh, but at the same time, it's given a lot more visibility than we ever have in security. Granted, it's also created a lot more commercialization of the industry, which is really going down a slippery slope when it comes to uh, actually trying to protect organizations. And that's what we're gonna see in 2015. All of these companies right now that are freaking out about Sony, they're gonna be like, oh, hey, we need to spend $10 million in a SIM and an IDS and an IPS and a next-gen firewall and all of this and all of this, and then we're gonna be protected against attacks, right? When they have all of their shit that's totally broke from the foundation uh, anyway. So, you know, it's not gonna get any better anytime soon, but at least we have more visibility and hopefully enough good people to start structuring it in a way that, that can hopefully take a step back and say, you need to actually get people in place. You actually have to have bodies. You actually have to do things the right way uh, versus a quick hit fix. So when you have people's and some people in some of the right processes, how do you prioritize what to fix? <clears throat> Risk, and that's a big word to say. <laughs> that's, that's like that's a four letter word. Pint at once. Right. Whenever you say risk. Right. Well, yeah. no, it's 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 about prioritization and what you can do for an organization. What's your highest likelihood of an attack occurring? You're never going to be able to predict it, but you also can't secure your entire company right away. Um, or probably ever. Uh, so, you know, it's a matter of, of understanding where your data is at, what you're trying to actually protect it, and how you actually go about doing it. So, you know, down to its core, there's a lot of simple practices that companies need to do that they haven't done. I mean, when Marcus, when Marcus Random created the first firewall, he's been talking about network segmentation, right? I mean, we're not doing network segmentation in our company. So, I mean, just basic stuff that, um, you know, we should be doing that we've been told, uh, you know, the foundation of, of, of a lot of the things in security. I mean, if we do those, we're going to start to think, uh, see a lot better results. I mean, say Sony, for example, and I'm not going to use Sony. I'm, I'm, I'm tired of hearing that. I'm going to use something else. Like, let's just say uh, Jimmy John's or Home Depot or Kmart, right? If they had segmentation between their stores, would the hackers have actually been able to compromise multiple stores and gain access to them? Probably not. Um, so, you know, there's, there's ways of limiting and minimizing breaches, and it all comes down to the foundation, not purchasing the next generation firewall. So, I mean, but, the, you know, segmentation doesn't prevent the breach. It... Minimizes, it contains slows, it. Yeah, slows the attacker down so that sure. you can move faster to detection. I mean, is that the strategy that we're recommending? I want to push back up. I think I'll push back a little bit on that. Um, yeah, I feel like the attacks that we've seen so far with, you know, name your big retailer, that's the minimum the attacker had to do to get the job done. That's not what they could have done. We haven't seen the true capabilities of these attackers so far. We've only seen the minimum they had to do to get the data they wanted. So I feel like segmentation may be something they may be able to easily work around depending on how um, these devices are being managed across enterprise. They can still piggyback across the same management infrastructure. I want to say it was Target or Kmart, one of the two, um, mentioned that their Windows update server, the, the system that pushed updates to the rest of the devices, was compromised during the process. Um, so no matter how you do segmentation, you still need centralized management somewhere, and if you compromise that, you're kind of boned. Well, it's, it's, it's a matter of having more things in place than not. So, I mean, you know, key things that we know that work, vulnerability management, reducing your low-hanging fruit, you know, network segmentation, you know, pivoting and post-exploitation. Uh, there's a lot of things that you can do, and, and especially in the monitoring and detection piece. You know, if I can identify key pieces of an attack happening in early stages, then great. I've, I've hopefully minimized uh, a significant amount of damage to my company. So it's not saying that it's, it's, it's one specific piece, but there's a lot of things that you can do to slow things down. As a pen tester, breaking into a company that has multiple you know, segmented networks, it takes me a long period of time to understand their, their organization, find the management network, find an attack in there, pivot for that, go into the rest of the network segments. Hopefully I have access to that. Hopefully I don't. Um, it takes a lot more time and effort. Hopefully during those stages you get detected. Absolutely. John, did you have more, more questions you want to chime in? No, I, you know, it, it, but this kind of gets back into a big question. I mean, all of us that are on this are, are really, really heavily focused on the offensive uh, side of it. I mean, uh, and, you know, we're, we're starting to see 
uh, Rapid7 starting to move into some defensive technologies. I had a meeting with them this last summer. And uh, Dave, you're starting to get into binary defense. We've been doing the active defense thing. And so the question I, I would have, being as offensive-minded as most of the people here are, do you think the defense even has a chance at all? I mean, I, I've kind of come around to the conclusion that Active Directory, from a security perspective, is a massive security hole. It's pretty much just like this, like you know, for another drinking term, this amazing super highway that gets to main admin very, very quickly. There's, there's like you know, hundreds of ways to do it. So, is it even possible to try to defend these networks? Is a big question that I'm getting with a lot of people, and I'd really love to get your your takes on it. So, if I can start, um, so. I, I did a talk called Attacker Ghost Stories, and it's all the, about the stuff that, you know, the basic stuff that you can do to protect things, right? So um, one of the biggest things, you know, is, is stopping them before they get on a system, right? So you're never going to stop someone from clicking yes on set, you know, and, and stopping them there because it's, it's not really exploitation. But 99.9% .9 of, um, of the exploit kits out there use exploits, right? Uh, very little um, APT style is social engineering where it's click through. They want that guaranteed exploit to work, right? Um, so if you use stuff like EMET, if you use stuff uh, with you know basic AV, if you use um, and you'll never get it, but least privilege, um, I think that stopping them at the at, at the endpoints is with all this you know uh, bring your own blah, right? I think that's that's the way that we're moving these days, and and with the offensive mindset, I think we can do a lot with um, moving towards uh, making it so that that first hop never happens, or very not as often happens, right? Yeah, and I can and I can see that. I mean, you know, as attackers, we understand the offense and and ultimately how to stop us as attackers. So, I mean, I completely agree with with Rob on the the endpoint piece where. I mean, you're seeing a lot of the attacks happening and occurring on those. Uh, you're seeing the majority of the breaches happen on those. I mean, it's still the perimeter or it's it's the endpoint. So, I mean, you have uh, an area of attack that you need to focus on, and that goes into those basic security practices. I mean, basic stuff like why do we need local admins on every single machine if we have Active Directory? Uh, you know, why do we need to have ticket lifespan of Kerberos for 12 hours? You know, like like there's a lot of lot of reasons for for default configurations and things that we do that we can harden and make things a lot 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 more um, challenging for an attacker. And unfortunately, we don't see those in a lot of companies. What are, what are the things that trip you up most on a penetration test in terms of gaining access to the initial system? The fact that null sessions are still allowed. <laughs> I mean, how many times? I've been using that trick for, for 12 years, and it's still in almost every organization you go to, uh, you know, like with, with RIT cycling and everything else. But no, I, common stuff. I, I always say this in one of my presentations, but, you know, what's the difference between, you know, 10 years ago when we did pen test to now? Not really much. I mean, you know, it's it's the default passwords. It's leaving stuff on, you know, open on the internet they didn't do, or some horrendous bug that's out there, or a missing patch. It's always the basic stuff. We rarely have to go into sophistication. Is there so any, I'll throw is one random thing out there. I recently did a pen test for a charity, and it was against their financial services provider, and they kicked my ass. To be honest, I mean, it was the first time I'd, I'd awesome. come up against an organization that actually did a good job. They had a, you know, my my default trick is a word document that's really an HTML file that is a UNC link to a server that captures the password. Twenty minutes later, I've got domain admin. It's done every time. No exploits needed whatsoever. It's my kind of standby. They blocked outbound SMB. They ran every single connection through uh, Zscaler. They had WebSense enabled. They had Invincia sandboxes. I mean, they had just every possible layer of defensive technology on the network applied at the same time, but they only had 50 people, so it wasn't a big deal. Like For them, they were able to do it because they could invest that heavily. Um, and I feel like for small organizations, you can go you know, as deep as you want and actually do a pretty good job of having decent defense deck, great, great um, incident re response, great reporting, great monitoring. But as soon as you get beyond you know, a couple hundred people, you can't really go down that route anymore. It doesn't really work anymore. So I feel like for on the defense side, you really have to start combining your offense and your defense. That's really where uh, Rapid Sevens kind of changed their uh, their model a little bit, and that we're looking at combining our defense with our offense. We can't close loop around it. On the research side, with the stuff I do on like labs, internet scanning, we started a uh, fun project recently where we started capturing the probes everyone else sent to the internet, and then turn around, rescan the internet with their own probes to figure out what they're trying to find. And it's been fun. We're like, hey, someone found a new bug. Let's go find all their bugs too. Great. We found all the exploitable bugs before they find it. So we've been uh, having access to um, the bugs that are being published before they're published just by monitoring what people are scanning for. And we haven't dumped any of it uh, pre-disclosure yet, but it's been pretty fun to watch. I think the big thing that HD just uh, hit on, or just one of the big things he hit on, was response. 
Um, so going through pen testing with Rapid7 and, and um, where I work now, it's the thing that tri has tripped me up time and time again is, you know, good response. Like if someone is actually doing, you know, on the defensive side, watching those logs or, or you know, I, I've gotten caught by sysadmins who are fanatical about their own logs, right? It's if, if you have a good response and you um, like program, um, then you'll p catch pen testers all the time and, and APT and all the fun other happy jazz that you can talk about. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the the real difference with this firm that I tested was that they had a admin who has basically never slept during the entire pen test period, which is annoying as hell for me. But um, he was on every single thing, every single piece of it, and you know, ended up being fairly collaborative towards the end. But at the same time, um, having good people, having um, ownership of the response process, a good escalation process is critical. Um, you know, a lot of folks like to uh, throw a target onto the bus and say, "Hey, you guys noticed this event? How come you didn't respond to it?" But we have no idea what their normal event flow looks like. We don't know whether that was one of 10,000 events that look just like it. So getting to the point where you can actually have actionable data, you can actually respond to events um, with a high, you know, certainty that it is a real event is a challenge that most organizations are currently facing. I actually had some self-reflection on that piece where, you know, if you look at, at the InfoSec community, as soon as an organization gets breached and it's public, they just want to rip on that company and say, hey, you know, they failed here, they did that wrong, or they did this wrong, and that's the wrong approach. And I caught myself doing it uh, when, when eBay came out. Uh, you know, when eBay happened, you know, they didn't respond to anybody. They said they didn't have the capability of sending emails out to individuals, and they had, you know, emails out two hours later after they said that. You know, it was just a really poor response, and, and I started catching myself on it being negative towards eBay. And, you don't know the situations that they're under the constraints or anything that's been going on with the breach itself. And so like, it's like the whole Sony thing. Again, I, I'm sorry I have to drink on that one, but you know, everybody's focusing on the negatives of Sony and all their malpractices and everything else they did. We don't know to, to what extent and how they got in there or, or the reasons they got in there. I mean, yeah, there's some emails but, you know, floating back and forth for things, but we shouldn't be ridiculing these companies and, and holding them accountable from the sense that they had horrible security practices. We should be trying to figure out and learn from this and make sure that we don't do it again. Um, and I think that's a big difference that we need to focus on in 2015 is instead of, of castrating these companies, focus on learning from them so that we can be better at it. Is there anything other than uh, diligent systems administrators or security professionals that prevents you from taking your attack further once you gain access to a system? Oh, yeah. Lots of stuff. Lots of stuff that can stop. I mean, it, not even just on the detective controls. I mean, you know, you look at, you look at how we pivot and, and do post-exploitation. I mean, just basic stuff like egress filtering. Uh, I mean, granted, you can do proxy aware stuff, but that takes a little more more time and effort. Um, you know, so I mean, basic things that that can at least limit or minimize uh, disallowing PowerShell execution and just executables in general uh, through in, instead of a certain couple of folders really jacks you up. You know, uh, Mubix had a trick that he used uh, for uh, when he presented in uh, what was it? Uh, where was it at? Uh, Switzerland, maybe was it Switzerland we were presented? Uh, just grabbing the user agent strings from from Java and not allowing Java apples from executing out of your your proxies. I mean, you know, stuff like that can can eliminate a large percentage of the low hanging fruit that we typically use as pen testers. And then from there, you know, look at how we do post exploitation. Now, to John's point, you know, Active Directory and Kerberos is its own vulnerability in itself, right? But you do lease permissions. There was a there was a company I did a pen test for. Uh, where you know I, I'd access to, to one member server, they actually had roles assigned from you know source IP addresses they can log into, and no domain admins were allowed to log into member servers. It was very difficult for me to to pivot and get to other systems, you know, and it took me forever. Like usually, like it was like another three more days before I was able to compromise everything else, and by then they had already detected me. So yeah, you can make a, you can totally make a hacker's life hell uh, by doing just some basic concepts. Hey, I'll also talk. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead, HG. All right, man. Sorry, doing the jinx. Um, I just want to comment. Like Dave's critical piece there is that pen testers, the most scarce resource they have is time. So if you want to pass your pen test, just fuck with your pen test the entire time to <laughs> run out of their available scope, and you're Absolutely. done. Absolutely. However, Absolutely. attackers, like, you know, you know I'll, I'll use the Sony word if I have to, but if someone has months and months and months to plan an attack, that doesn't really help them. But if you want to just pass your audit, just fuck with your, your auditors until they run out of time, basically. So the other thing, um, again, back in the attacker ghost story stuff is... Um, Stuff that got me caught quite a bit was was simple, and I, I call them, uh, you know, uh, I don't remember what I call them. Um, they're honey tokens, um, so uh, canaries or whatever. Um, the little little things that um, entice an attacker, but have no use in the in the business. So you put like um, password audit 2014.xls on a share, right? There's no reason that anyone on the planet should be accessing that file. 
And the only reason they should ever do it is if they're not supposed to, right? Um, you put just dummy data in there and then put, you know, access logs and then set up a script so that any time someone tries to access it, it automatically alerts the security team, right? I guarantee that every pen tester slash APT is looking for, you know, extra passwords. So if you put something as enticing as a password audit in there, it's guaranteed that someone's going to go for it. And there's zero false positive. The only false positive you might get is, you know, uh, an insider just being curious and then you have a go have a talk with them. Um, but stuff like that has caught me caught more times than I can count uh, on pen tests. And it's it's usually the the smart people that put those together um, that set them up. So it all comes back to people. I, I noticed no one uh, mentioned any kind of antivirus or endpoint protection. What's your <laughs> advice for, for folks that are implementing that technology? I mean, do you advise I, them as to how much effort they should put into that? I'm completely flabbergasted and, and, and surprised that uh, the, the Sony breach that antivirus didn't pick up that malware. I just don't know how that happened. <laughs> so actually, I do have a positive on HIPS. Um, so um, there isn't a company on the planet that isn't over you know, 10,000 people that um, has enabled HIPS to actually do any protection. Right, so it just alerts, and they all go to you know a centralized logging server, and then no one ever looks at them. Um, so if if they actually do enable like blocking of certain uh, pivoting uh, controls, like hacker tools, um, or or anything that they see accessing specific registry keys, like uh, like uh, specific HIPs do for um, like uh, password dumping from the registry. That kind of stuff. If they enable blocking that, there's no reason that any should, anything should access that, and it's really hard to get around. I want to. So, sorry, did you have some? Uh, so I wanted to just talk about open source for a moment um, and switch back to big vulnerabilities. Um, several vulnerabilities were released this year in big uh, open source projects. What are your thoughts on the security models for open source projects and uh, how that's impacted, especially some things this year? Ask NTP. Yeah, don't, don't. Do you think open source software is more secure, or less secure, or does not matter? The debate's not even worth having. I think there's a sense of complacency that since the software is open source, people are going to look for the bugs and find the bugs and report the bugs. And in reality, we still find things like the open cell bug from this year, things like that. Um, I think a lot of folks, you know, if you're doing a pen test and you're going to come across an Apache web server, you're first instinct isn't to go download a patch and go audit it yeah. anymore. It used to be 15, 20 years ago. It's not these days to go audit every software you find if it's open source. You just assume that if it's open source, it's probably pretty solid. And I think we're starting to become complacent with our assumptions in that sense. But, okay, think about Metasploit in that instance. We got a million lines of code in Metasploit. How rock often solid, does... rock solid. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer, on, HD. Good answer. Uh, every day. Yeah, he was quick on that, too. You know? Everybody audit Metasploit now. Like, boom. <laughs> We have at least two exploits for a Metasploit and a Metasploit, so I think we're good. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so flight delayed. Awesome you write your own exploit for your own tool. It's amazing. Well, someone's got to do it. Might as well do it right. That's right. If you can't laugh at yourself, who can you laugh at? I mean, <laughs> no kidding. Yeah, well, I the got something right? up on so, the exploit your you know, own tool thing. SSL has to be as large or larger than, you know, Metasploit. So, uh, there, you know, yes, people are looking at it. Yes, I think that um, there are security researchers that are, are looking at SSL, particularly there, but... Um, you know, in the past as well, but it's a lot of code to go through. And you're also, um, static analysis based tools aren't going to catch everything, right? Like the, the SSL Heartbleed stuff. There's no way that, um, you know, any static analysis tool would have caught that, right? So let's, let, let's, let's make this debate something interesting. So how many bugs this year were there for open source that made a significant amount of impact? Major ones. How many were released for Microsoft, which is closed source? Probably a lot more for Microsoft. Uh, so where's the debate? I mean, I, I don't understand. When it comes to open source, I mean, you're expecting folks to audit and everything else to HD's point. A lot of times that doesn't happen. Um, and so the assumption is, is that since it's open source, it's more secure. It does allow you to find more bugs. But at the same time, when you're a powerhouse like Microsoft that has a formal SDLC with security embedded into it, source code analysis and everything else, and yet, you know, they had the most amount of exposures this year when it comes to a platform. I mean, that's a that's a that's a pretty big statement there on the the closed source versus open source side. I mean, what was it? Uh, so, um, I think it was a Cisco that came out with a statistic or ZDNet or something like that that said that um, Internet Explorer bugs were up three hundred percent from last year. Three hundred percent from last year. I mean, 
I don't, I don't really see a debate on the open source versus closed source side. I think you're going to have more of the closed source and the fuzzing uh, side. And it's scary that if you don't have access to the source code and they're already finding all those bugs, and yet, you know, how many more, if someone actually had access to the source code, do they have, i.e. governments, uh, when you have access to the source code? Now, Dave, okay. how, mu how much of that statistic is made up uh, on the closed source versus open uh, based on market share? I mean, think, think about how many folks point. use IE at, at closed source versus some of these open source deals that do not. And I, and I think it becomes market share because look at, look at OpenSSL. I was just going to go there. How many, of these, how many of these open source bugs we've seen this year have been things that have been bugs for years, if not decades? Mm -hmm. Because the theory of mini eyes and the practice turns out to be different. Also, on the Microsoft side, how many of those vulnerabilities were discovered internally at Microsoft because, well, but look at, but look because at, they uh, tear their shit open. Tavis, Tavis tears Microsoft open every every weekend, right? So <laughs> Tavis, <laughs> he's, he's tears, like, hey, I'm going to spend. Tavis tears everybody go. open every weekend, and <laughs> dirty. Tavis tears oh, everybody dirty. open look every at, weekend. What, and a, wait, wait. So here, Sorry. here, let's completely derail this. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Jack. I was waiting for that. Yeah. You, you were, you were so we have, we have spent, <laughs> within the context of Space where Rogue I work, even here yet. I know. and the world that all of us work in, do vulnerabilities really matter considering that, you know, conservatively 98% of them are never exploited? And yes, I just pulled that number out of my ass so it may smell bad. <laughs> Well, it How's that for a setup for this team? Yeah, it's right? whether it's a backdoor <laughs> vulnerability or not, Jack. You know, let's face it. Uh, oh, yeah, I had to go there, right? So, no, no, no. But, uh, but, but there was I mean, how much effort do we put into vulnerabilities that will never be exploited by anyone everywhere, ever? But, but there was a point that wasn't really brought Lots. forward as well, I think, and that is it's really a matter of where is the attention focused, right? I mean, you know, Dave's right. There's a lot of stuff that came out uh, with Microsoft. Okay, great. But there's a lot of attention focused on it as well. How much attention is, is, and I think that's sort of quasi come out here, how much attention is really being focused on a lot of these big open source projects, and I think HD mentioned that as well. Really not much, right? I mean, there's become a complacency. There's become a, a default acceptance. Um, and I think uh, you look at uh, what happened with OpenSSL, that kind of broke that open for people. They were like, oh, shit, you know, maybe this is not so good. Um, and people started looking, digging deeper, and, and you know, more things came out. So... Uh, I I've seen know, Zalewski like, um, kind of do some dynamite fishing lately as well with uh, American Fuzzy Lop and the sheer number of bugs coming out of things like Zlib and uh, libget, uh, BFD, uh, strings, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so he's been dumping you know, dozens if not hundreds of vulnerabilities out of open source software over the last few months, but we're not seeing a lot of media attention around that. Instead, what we're seeing is him, him saying, hey, here's my software, have fun, go find your own zero day, which has been great, and a lot of people are doing it right now. There's, I don't know how many processing cores I have right now currently running American Fuzzy Lop, but it's not a small number. Um, so I feel like there is a lot of research happening in the security space on open source software, and there's a lot of bones being found, but they're not really being exploited or getting a lot of attention. Yeah, so it gets even worse, right? Because it's you're, the effort's being spent, but it's it's again not getting any publicity. Uh, that that's but even. Does it have to be have publicity to get fixed? Like there, you know, if no one's going to patch anyways, it doesn't matter, right? <laughs> Might as well find the bugs anyways, because they're still going to be there next well, year when you find the same system. <laughs> and I, and, you know, I don't want to derail this or bring it back on the tracks or wherever we're at in relation <laughs> to the train and the tracks, but it doesn't matter. I mean, I, I honestly. You know, I, I get into these conversations a lot, open source versus closed source, and I don't think it matters. I think the bigger issue is old, out-of-date software. I mean, it doesn't matter if the new software is better or less secure or more secure. I, I just don't care. The fact is, in most organizations, if you look at their standard workstation build, you just go to the help desk, and you have them build you a notebook with all their software that's built in. You're going to find probably hundreds of pieces of software, software that's been there since mid-2000s, maybe even early 2000s, and it's still there. I mean, as much as we like to talk about secure things and how to actually secure the things, the fact is a lot of organizations are running ancient, crappy software with no security built into it whatsoever. So, you know, whenever my customers start having trying to have the conversation of open source versus closed source, I try to shut that conversation down as quickly as possible because it's, it, 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 it's like Coke versus Pepsi, tastes great, less filling. Um, drinking beer or you know drinking Coors, whatever it is that people are into is whatever they're into. But the real issue is we have a lot of out-of-date software that we haven't even begun to start trying to remove from our organizations. I agree. I mean, MS, I mean MSO 8067, still there. Hey, still we got it. that last month. <laughs> See? Yeah. It still pops up. 
<laughs> still pops up. Just blows your mind. Well, but it does. What's it's just a month. I got it last week. <laughs> and probably I was like, will I was next. Like, I went to a doctor and got it removed last week. You're, I'm good now. You did. You're good now. <laughs> I always like to relate uh, security to like a house design. I mean, if your architecture and your, your design is flawed from the get-go and your foundation sucks, you know, bolting on locks and doors is something that's going to collapse and fall anyway. It doesn't make a difference. So to John's point, I mean, you have years and years and years of neglect of old systems, of, of not keeping up to date because it really wasn't, you know, important at that time. You have to go back and retrofit and fix all of those things before you can really say, you know, going forward, this, these are the things that we're going to fix. So. I mean, we're, we're going to be busy for a long time. There's no, not going to be any shortage of, of having to fix things in any organization. Um, it's just a matter of understanding that we have to go back and fix those things, that we can't bolt things on. Uh, we can't just slap a WAF in to fix, you know, bad coding practices. We should go and recode it and maybe a WAF on top of it to help out. Um, you know, those are the things that, that we need to instill in people in the security industry that right now I think we're losing focus of. Hey, PCI I, well, says you can slap a WAF on it. That's right. It's, it's, it's like putting a bird on it. 6 .6. Hey, I'm a QSA. I'm a QSA, actually, for PCI. And 6.6. Oh, .6. Get out. Hold on. Get out. Oh, 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 wait. Wait. We're talking about QSA. <laughs> think I actually do oh, PCI. Oh, another another I former QSA is joined. You're part of the problem, man. Wait, wait, wait. I'm going to offend all sorts of people. Is Can you be a former? Isn't that like that other thing where you're never former? You're always a QSA. Hey, hey, hey. The doctor can't believe that. But I do like Dave's thing. It's like it's like trying to unplug a stuck toilet in a house that's burning down but you know <laughs> going back to going going wow. back to the architecture oh, thing totally and, stealing that one i don't I know if John. i remember that, that that's too. beautiful yeah. right there right? yeah that's, so, john's trying stuff. to make a real point here but we're all just yeah, laughing so about please, but, yeah, just keep going can you say that one more time john please it's like trying to unplug a toilet in a house that's burning down <laughs> so but going back to the architecture <laughs> thing this is all good <laughs> You know what, what we're doing is is valuable. I hate it whenever I talk to security architects or I talk to people that aren't in security, and they're like, "Oh man, pen testers like Radcliffe or pen testers like H.D. Moore and Dave Kennedy." They never say me, which is which I think is good. Uh, those guys That's are part the of the problem. Right. Put all of you guys in prison. Right. And, and I, I don't think that they understand the concept of architecture. Architecture is nothing more than understanding the absolute failure points of your components within your design. And then you design your architecture to handle those failure points appropriately. And right now, almost all of our architectures, and I love the analogy Dave talked about with the house, right now, almost all of our architectures have almost all of these rotting components all kind of together, and it's going to fail. But if you go back to engineering, for if you go back like two, three, four hundred years, thousand years, our buildings sucked. I mean, go Go to Europe and, you know, you look at the massive Gothic churches, you know, as awesome looking as those are, from a structural perspective, they just, they kind of don't hold a candle to anything that we have today. And Bullshit. right now, we're Bullshit. in the area of Bullshit. IT security Bullshit. architecture, Bullshit. of a bunch of people running Bullshit. around knocking over Bullshit. mud huts. Keep going, John. Keep going, John. I'm done. Oh. Bullshit. <laughs> Bullshit. Wait, Bullshit. There's, a, there's an important Actually, point that John was trying to make. And I, I, he's to, trying to make an important point. He is. But and I'm going to try to help is him. Because I'm a nice guy like that. There is two thousand. <laughs> Andy's your boss. There is two thousand. <laughs> there's two thousand to twenty four hundred year old engineering. Oh, he got stuck on the Europe thing. That survives today. <laughs> that will last anything we can build today. Including, including and, Jack. and Jack was there to oh, build Jack, all of them. Jack, I am. <laughs> Jack, I am. I am oh, so sorry. Jackson, I am Jack, so you're, sorry. You're, you're about you're to lose here. this. Uh, but if we go back but, and we look the, at all the buildings you look from 2,250 Romans, some years are, ago, there are roads that the Romans like built you're, 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 that are you're, still solid. You're talking about Jack's house that he grew up in, so he's very grumpy about that. Wait, John's point is designed for failure. Don't. Yes, exactly. Well, that, hey, and that's that is what, engineering. That that's is what, what the software is. industry does. We design to fail. I don't think they. they oh just, wait, I got that. <laughs> I got this. They just fail. Design. Yeah, you've got too many words in there. Yeah. So, but, but but it comes down to this is good. I mean, security researchers. You know what HD does. You know, creating a framework that everybody can come together, play, and write exploits for. We're understanding where the failure points are within our components that we build our architectures out of. And unfortunately, a lot of people look at us as just a bunch of wannabe Hollywood-style hackers that we want to just kind of uh, get that type of cred of being a hacker. But really, and we are the architects and engineers in this field because we are understanding the failure components or the failure points within 
in our components that are being designed. So whenever we show up and people ask us for defenses, you know, now all of a sudden we can have logical conversations and say, okay, all of these things that you're using that you have set up, these null sessions that still exist, the fact that UNC paths within Word documents can still trigger and fire, we're starting to let our customers know, look, these are the vulnerabilities in your architecture. Unfortunately, most of our people are like looking at their falling down building and they're like, ah, I'll throw another coat of paint on it. That'll help. Well, I mean, the, the, the problem is, is that we have, you know, these small businesses that, that can fix those things um, when, you know, we get a pen test. But the large organizations that have the biggest problems, I think it's not really uh, a problem on, on the, um, that we're not having pen testers, not having infrastructure people. I think um, our solution to that as an industry has been vulnerability management. And the problem there is we, we go into vulnerability management as we're going to get this tool that pushes a button and gets a report. And then you look at the report and see which one's the high risk and then fix those where we don't actually pull this all back to what Dave originally said. Um, we don't have anyone looking at those reports and saying, these are the risky things. These are the things that are important to us. And because these four vulnerabilities that are lows or four vulnerabilities that are highs and one medium are, are together on this system means that my entire infrastructure is at, at risk. We don't have anyone doing that um, and or rarely do that. Right. So there are big systemic problem is that our vulnerability management is so broken that we have to have pen testers come in every year and tell us what's actually the problem. Oh, God. We, we need, like, SPAF on here to get the perspective that shows that the fact that we accept even that means that we've lost. Because we're not, you're, no, you're not even talking about fundamental security. We're, we're, we're pushed into a role, and there's nothing else we can do except look for stuff we should fix because the idea of talking about running inherently secure is is left for crazy old people on that note we're Chris, all gonna we, shoot ourselves do we have time <laughs> oh, that was yeah, that, that was, was sad that was, <laughs> do we have time to do five questions yeah okay oh, we should yeah. five questions okay dave hd rob you ready okay go dave three words to describe yourself uh, I, I hate talking about myself. There, too many words. That's, that's, that's fine. You <laughs> you overflow the buffer. <laughs> HD talk self. Three words. Love, I, hugs for everyone. Uh, HD. Free tacos today. Yeah, that works. That works. Rob, don't stop learning. Rob, if you were a serial killer. Don't stop learning. <laughs> 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 Hey, hey, no Dave. more drugs for Oh, Dave. God. <laughs> hey, don't, don't go into the rock and roll industry, okay? Well, sorry, sorry. Rob, if you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? Spoon. HD? There is no spoon. Plunger. Dave? Uh, yeah, HD stole my plunger. Um, <laughs> get on the back. Hugs. <laughs> some sexual toy of some sort. You'd have to work. Wow. Dave, if you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? Who? HD? Oh, Doctor Who, you suck. Evidence. Rob? <laughs> Rob? Oh, crap. Probably. There That's a good one. We'll take it. We'll take it. <laughs> Rob? Wait, the... wait, wait. What about HD going first? Oh, okay. HD. I think this is appropriate that he go first. Yeah, yeah. HD, in the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? I'm a spectator. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best answer I've heard all year. Do you not know what I'm doing to HD next time I see him? Can taste. Oh shit. <laughs> Dave, uh, first I or second? To go second, because I'm too anxious uh, to to wait to get touched uh, there. So he uh -huh. likes to be in the middle of a human caterpillar. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh god. Oh. <laughs> Ouch. Rob. Well, if HD's spectating and uh, and Dave is last, I gotta be first, I guess. There you go. I was gonna say you could be the one. You could be the one holding the camera. <laughs> Dave, Dave, pick two celebrities to be your parents. Uh, I, so I, I, obviously Chuck Norris is one, and I'd probably go with it with a gay couple. So it'd be Chuck Norris and um, George Clooney. HD. I'd pass. I think. Rob. Uh, Robin Williams and, uh, 
I don't know. The mom I don't, is I don't. the mom is tough. I know. Because you can't just choose someone hot. I know that's what your mind is going right now. <laughs> if you but say, then you're like, she's my mom. You so, say but I got a question Jolie. on that. Everybody that we talk to, whenever we say, you know, parents, it's like they're always going for hot women. That's kind of creepy. It is. That is pretty creepy. It's a Freudian. <laughs> we're, we're a pretty creepy I mean, bunch. It's not even subtle. I mean, it's like, Embrace what, what, what does that I, say I about I completely us? skewed that result. Sorry about that. There you go. Hillary Clinton. There you go. That's up a- H- 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 And it's now a- the universe has balanced right. itself Winston out. Churchill well done. And Betty White. There you go. Betty White was oh, my wow. choice for mom. Very wow. nice. Wow. Awesome. Damn. Thank All right, you. and you know what? This is the first time that someone on the podcast today has it's not, not answered, answered Angelina, Angelina Jolie, Jolie, Jolie for their mom. Yeah. yeah. Good job, guys. Thank you very much <laughs> for appearing on Security <laughs> Weekly. We'll Thanks for having us. With that, we're going to take a short break and come back. So don't go anywhere and don't forget to donate to EFF, EFF.org forward slash donate. We'll be right back. Hey, 